It's now uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Stephen Chu, who's a professor of physics and molecular and cellular physiology at Stanford University, former Secretary of Energy under the Obama administration. So, uh, Steve. Okay, great. Um, let me just uh, share a screen. And I'm going to talk about um, an area of greenhouse gas emission that only has recently gotten the attention it deserves. In my opinion, next to energy efficiency, it may be some of the lowest hanging fruit after we convert to automobiles and as much wind and solar and transmission distribution as we can. So um, just to recall um, from the IPCC's most recent report, let me get this down here. Um, if you look at the carbon emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions around the world, you see that in this uh, yellow over here, this is net CO2 from land use, forestry, things of that nature. This orange is methane, of which roughly half of it is due to agriculture and raising animals. And then the dark blue is nitrous oxide and virtually all of it, 80%, is due to agriculture. And so if you take this in total, the amount of CO2 emissions from agriculture, food supplies, uh, and other land use uh, is more than uh, the amount, oops, why did I do that? It is more than the uh, greenhouse gases from electricity generation around the world. What's uh, a little bit disturbing about this is if you go deeper into the technical summary of the last IPCC report, you see in food industry land transport and buildings, the blue is called socioeconomic factors, which is the shift in dietary choice, reduce animal proteins, avoid food waste, overconsumption. And the gray is emissions that can be, cannot be avoided or reduced through demand side options, i.e. people still have to eat. And then they list the technological adoption of food as currently not applicable. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, why it might not be currently applicable. And this talk is uh, more about history than technology, but it will have a lot of technology. Why history? Uh, it's those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I'm reminded of the Stan Wilson cartoon, which the soothsayer says, you will make the same foolish mistakes you have made before, not only once, but many, many times again. So let's do a brief history of agriculture. Uh, the first real agriculture started uh, in a time roughly 12,000 years ago, uh, our history books tell us it started in the Middle East in this area uh, where Persia used to be. Um, but that's not complete because this abruptly at the same time, uh, in addition to the Middle East, it also started in North and South China, New Guinea, Ethiopia, and in Eastern North America, Mesopotamia, South America. So it essentially started all around the world. And you can ask, well, why did it start about this time 12,000 years ago? So here's a rough uh, proxy for the measurement of temperature over the last 400,000 years. And first let's ask when were Homo sapiens essentially fully developed? And it is about this time. And so if you look in the scale from the present time zero back 12,000 years, it started in this little sliver of time over here. And this little sliver of time over here, we were in a warming period and in a period of essential climate stability, relative climate stability. And it may have been because of this climate stability in this warm period that you can actually have enough stability to allow agriculture to take root. So now I uh, move to uh, a review by a, uh, a Nobel economist, Robert Vogel, uh, says catching up with the economy, he wrote in 1999. And as he looks at all the major developments around the world and around civilization, he starts at the beginning of the first agricultural revolution. 
And in this first agricultural revolution, there was domestication of wheat, rice, cattle, chickens, yeast for bread, the first irrigation, and probably to me the most important, we learned how to ferment grain and fruit juice. Um, but then this pokes along and you see the invention of uh, the plow, first cities, going to metals, beginning of writing, the beginning of mathematics, so and so. And then over here in this cusp, uh, you see the beginning of the, not the cusp, but this um, sharp bend in the population of the world, the beginning of the second agricultural revolution. So what was the second agricultural revolution? Um, it was uh, largely in this period between 1650, 70, 70, a large part of it happened in Europe. And uh, at that point, we learned how to rotate crops. Uh, the Dutch improved the Chinese plow. And one of the most striking things was the idea of enclosure. Before this time, uh, land was viewed as a common right access. And they said, well, you don't only have to do this and you allowed exclusive ownership of the land. And so <clears throat> once actually people began to own land, they can say, well, we can care for it and we can develop higher forms of agriculture and we don't have to overgraze, et cetera, et cetera. And so this idea of everybody can dip into a common pool and extract as much as you want still plagues us. We still have deep problems in international fishing where governments around the world actually subsidize the fishermen to go out and with um, uh, additional fuel modernization of fleets so they can go dipping into uh, the world sea but after they do that they actually uh, are buying rights in other people's fishing other countries fishing grounds so they can fish there so we still have this huge problem of overfishing because uh, of this tragedy of the commons the other things include market tariffs, tolls, transportation. And you see that most of this stuff was actually policy. It was not technology. All right, now we're going to bring uh, to the next agricultural revolution. And um, Sir William Crooks was elected as the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And in his inaugural address, instead of uh, using the usual address of shucks you want to be i'm honored to be here he started by saying that england all of civilized civilized countries are in deadly peril what was he talking about he was saying that europe was going to run out of the um, nitrogen-based fertilizer that they were importing from south america and unless a substitute was found millions would starve and he said this very poetically he said it is the chemist who must come to the rescue before we are in an actual grip of actual dearth, the chemist will step in and postpone the day of famine to so distant a period that we and our sons and grandsons may legitimately live without the undue solicitude for the future. I guess uh, daughters didn't count as much in those days. In any case, that speech set off a race to develop artificial nitrogen-based fertilizers the quote winner of the race was Fritz Haber, who received the Nobel Prize in 1918, but he didn't do it alone. He did it with a, um, a chemist named uh, Carl Bosch, uh, but Bosch didn't get the Nobel Prize with Haber, so they invented another reason, the Nobel Committee, for giving Carl Bosch a Nobel Prize in 1931 for his development of high pressure, high temperature catalysis. So as time goes on, they realize that this is really a very big deal. And in 2007, Garrett Ertl, who was a surface scientist, uh, received a Nobel Prize. And in the citation for the Nobel Prize, the committee, the Nobel Committee said, at last we are beginning to really understand the Haber-Bosch process. So two and a half Nobel Prizes for the development of making of ammonia, the development of fertilizer, and this artificial nitrogen-based fertilizer allowed the population to grow uh, in this process. So it, the population doubled. All right, another revolution comes along due to Norman Borlaug in the 1950s and 60s. And what he did is he crossed strains of wheat 
uh, so that the grains would be much bigger, but there was a problem. The grains were so heavy that the wheat would bend over and fall down. So he uh, produced bread dwarf strains of wheat, which have thicker, shorter stems. Uh, but then there was another problem because they were susceptible to a fungus, a plant fungus. So he bred these plants to be resistant to this fungus. And so these plants uh, could withstand lots of fertilizer, lots of irrigation uh, that were needed in poor soils. And that really revolutionized agriculture in developing countries. So from 1960 to 2016, we look at the amount of land put under cereal production. And we see that it's roughly flat. And yet uh, the cereal production uh, actually uh, more than tripled. And so this is uh, not only for developing countries, but for example, in the United States, corn yield per unit area per acre increased about eightfold. Okay, so the environmental groups began to oppose the Green Revolution practices, and they pressured the Rockefeller Foundation, which originally funded Norman Borlaug and the Ford Foundations, and the World Bank to stop funding African agriculture projects and stop supplying them with inorganic fertilizer to Africa because it was deemed by these environmentalists as unnatural. Uh, and so Norman Borlaug defends his work and he says, the first essential component of social justice is adequate food for all of mankind. He goes on to say that some of the environmental lobbyists of the Western nations are the salt of the earth, but many of them are elitists. They've never experienced the physical sensation of hunger. They do their lobbying from comfortable office suites in Washington or Brussels. If they live just one month amid the misery of the developing world, as I have for 50 years, they'd be crying out for tractors and fertilizer and irrigation canals and be outraged that fashionable leaders back home were trying to deny them these things. So uh, this legacy still continues. If you look uh, on the x-axis, the amount of fertilizer used, and on the y-axis, cereal grains per yield per hectare, you find that African countries use very little fertilizer, and because of that, they lag in the food production per unit area of land by roughly an order of magnitude. Uh, so uh, now there are other places like Kuwait, UAE, uh, that perhaps have lots of sun, absolutely no water, but with fertilizer and desalinization, you can have incredibly high production of agriculture. Uh, there are other issues. So let me go on and talk about the suspicions of modern technologies, not only just plant crossbreeding or animal crossbreeding, but genetically modified plants of the modern kind, molecularly modified genetic plants instead of uh, crossbreeding. And um, as I've been trying to point out, we've been genetically modifying plants and animals for over 4,000 years, but let me go a little bit into this. If I show you pictures of corn and ask you, what was the native corn? Or what's the corn we eat today? The native corn is really unrecognizable. Let me actually go to animals we eat today. If you look at animals such as beef, cattle, pigs, broiler, chickens, and turkeys, the full circle uh, denotes the normal lifetime of these animals. And the little red segments denote the time in which they're slaughtered. So for example, in beef cattle, it's between 18 and 24 months after birth, they're, they're slaughtered for food. Pigs, 22 to 26 weeks, and chickens, only 40 days. So these animals have been bred to grow very, very efficiently, very fast. Uh, and for example, in America, a pig average time 24 weeks since birth, and the average weight is 280 pounds. Well, what about turkeys? Well, um, here are some domestic turkeys, typically slaughtered two, three and a half months uh, after birth. Uh, they kind of are very breast heavy because Americans like this. In fact, some of them are so breast heavy, uh, they uh, can't mate and are artificially inseminated. 
And so these turkeys don't really look much like wild turkeys. Just to remind you, remind you these, this is a picture of wild turkeys. We don't know exactly how old they are of unknown ages. I do know how old this wild turkey is. Uh, 101 turkey, wild turkey is eight years old. Okay, so there were some unintended consequences of these multiple, multiple industrial and agricultural revolutions. We've learned of greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated gases, and they have changed our climate. And so uh, if you think about this and look at the annual CO2 emissions, this takes us to 2020 and the world emissions, and you see China now has surpassed the United States and EU and is about equal to them combined, and India is about to take off. But if we compare this to food production, we find that if beef and dairy cattle were a country, the roughly five gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year would be more emissions than any other country except China. And well, actually we're equal to the US at the moment. Um, there's another thing you should know, and this has to do with the fact that agriculture is an example of profound geoengineering how profound? Well, half the arable land is under cultivation and uh, the livestock and the human biomass, that's us and the animals we eat, represent about 96% of all mammal mass in the world. So that includes all the lions and tigers and bears and mice and rats and everything else. Uh, we're it, humans and the animals we eat. All right, let's talk about the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, various food sources, beef, lamb, dairy herds, cheese and poultry. This is greenhouse gas emissions per unit energy of food. And you see that if you compare beef, lamb and, and dairy cattle to uh, cereals, rice, soybeans, potatoes, wheat, rye, there's a huge difference in this but that's kilocalories. What about protein? Well, it's a little bit better, but not much better. And so you still see in terms of the amount of protein, uh, beef uh, and lamb and mutton and milk from the dairy herds lead the way. So there should be more efficient ways of doing this. And we really need a fourth agricultural revolution. We need improved crop yields with less fossil-based fertilizers and pesticides. There's an opportunity to restore carbon in the soil, uh, which we have been depleting since the beginning of agriculture. Um, but um, uh, there's uh, uncertainty in the best technologies for this at the present. Uh, milk and beef substitutes um, and improved crop yields, less fertilizer and pesticides, as I've said before drought resistance um, because the summer months will be hotter, the water tables and the underground aquifers are shrinking and then we need to have uh, more resistance. And finally, if we're gonna grow plants on excess foul land, we can do something about that as carbon capture. I'll talk about that in a moment. So let me go to some of the modern methods uh, in 2018, Frances Arnold got a Nobel Prize for her work in directed evolution. And what she did is she took uh, some um, microbes and their DNA. She induced random mutations, huge amounts of mutations. Uh, these mutations were then stuck into bacteria to produce mutated enzymes. Of course, most of them don't survive, but some of them do. And then you try to look at the uh, surviving microbes and you uh, test them for the desired phenotype. Uh, you take those uh, and you reinsert, you do additional mutations, you reinsert and you go around in cycles. And what she found was that very quickly in only three generations of cycles, because you're doing thousands and even millions of experiments all in parallel at once, an enzyme that breaks down milk protein, casein, uh, was found that could work uh, 256 times better. And it turned out that this variant of the enzyme had about 10 different mutations. Uh, 
there were other techniques. Uh, Wilhelm Stemmer introduced this technique called DNA shuffling, where you have targeted genes, you have some um, uh, enzymes that chop up the fragmented DNA, you put on primers, you stick them on, you have PCR in the primers, and you shuffle the genes around. And so it's sort of uh, like, it's analogous to sexual mating without as much fun, uh, but it creates a diversity in the gene pool. And so these things were great, except they were actually stemmed from random mutations and shuffling, but there's another opportunity called synthetic biology where you can actually put genes in specifically with things you could not possibly find with random mutations. And let me give you an example. Uh, there's found a bacteria uh, called uh, Bacillus, I don't know how to pronounce the name, BT. Um, and this uh, gene, when put into plants, turns out to be a natural insecticide. And so eggplant was engineered to express this BT gene. It got regulatory approval in Bangladesh. Uh, eggplant is a a major food staple in Bangladesh. And uh, in 2014, 20 farmers tried the new variety. They liked it because before they would have to apply insecticides maybe 80 times in a growing season. So they were being bathed in insecticides and some of it would leak over into the food supply as well. It wasn't all completely biodegradable. So, so there was this huge problem and the insecticides were expensive. And so on the left-hand side, you see the adoption between 2013-14, when it was first introduced in an experimental way by agricultural research institutes in Bangladesh. And by 2017-18, it had become uh, a mainstay. Another example is a similar sort of genetic implantation into cotton, uh, BT cotton that uh, meant that you could use far less uh, virtually no insecticides. And we see that from 2002 to 2018, it can completely dominate the cotton planted in India. So this is an example of um, uh, genetic modification in synthetic biology um, uh, that really took root and were feeding hungry people in, in developing countries. Uh, let's talk about food. Uh, most of the food we eat today is farmed, so-called agriculture, and the captured fishery uh, is uh, plateauing. It's plateauing as we fish out the seas, as I discussed before. And so there's an opportunity here to do some genetic modification, but you have to be careful because you don't want fish to be released in the wild of uh, genetically modified until you're absolutely sure, and that could take decades. Uh, so there are no intended consequences. So as an example, we can look at salmon, and this is the wild salmon catch from 1950 to 2010 declining because we're simply overfishing. And uh, so people have worked on genetically modifying the salmon. Uh, they put in, uh, they took a salmon from a very fast growing Pacific Chinook salmon, and then uh, a promoter sequence from another fish called the ocean pout, so the salmon could grow all year round. It took 20 years to get FDA approval with the stipulation that these fish can only be grown in seal tanks on land where the uh, effluent from these tanks uh, had to be super filtered so no DNA could possibly or no fish or fish eggs could possibly escape into a stream. And, uh, and so, uh, but they work. This is uh, the same age fish, uh, the wild salmon and the genetically modified salmon. Okay, let's talk about milk. Milk uh, it comes from dairy cows, cows burp and uh, they cause a lot of methane gas. And if you look at the milk consumption around the world, you find in 2021, India dominates because they don't eat meat for the most part, followed by the EU. So this is the entire EU uh, and this is United Kingdom, uh, United States, China. And then you go down the list and you go down, down, down. And then there's a, a break in the graph here. So just to show you that uh, people, 
In Japan, Taiwan, Philippines don't drink much milk. Uh, in fact, much of the world is lactose intolerant. And so people are beginning to cast around for milk substitutes, uh, soy, oats, almonds, coconuts. Almonds are not ideal because they require a lot of water, but soy and oats uh, are pretty good. Coconuts are not ideal either. And so this is an example of oat-based milk. Uh, and um, uh, now full disclosure, I'm the board of directors of Oatly, but Oatly is trying to develop an enzyme to increase the oat milk production. And so that you can use more of the naturally occurring fiber and proteins in oats. Uh, and uh, the issue is they're finding that the best enzymes uh, could be made through genetic modification of microbes. And the question is, are the molecules GMO or is the molecule just a molecule? So anyway, so the other thing that we find is that you can genetically mi modify microbes. Uh, and when you plant cereals like corn with microbes that have been modified so they can enter into symbiotic relationships with the roots of the corn uh, in the little barrier between the corn root and the soil of the so-called rhizome. And a Pivot Bio, a company in the Bay Area, has been uh, delivering uh, to, and selling to farmers in the last four or five years uh, these microbes plus corn. And um, uh, half the nitrogen-based fertilizer has been replaced. They're now working in sorghum and wheat. And it's not only the nitrogen-based fertilizer. The microbes take the nitrogen they find in the soil, turn it into ammonia-like compounds, and when the plant asks for food, they feed it the food. And so this is great, not only because you begin to limit, decrease the amount of fertilizer, which comes from ammonia, urea, and ultimately natural gas, it's the N, fertilizer runoff, the N2O, that's actually a larger contributor to the greenhouse gas than the energy used to make the fertilizer. And so microbial phosphorus and potash production are the next targets. And uh, it's looking pretty good. There are a bunch of biotech companies, for example, a company called Zymergen, which uh, uses, looks at all the microbes and it was collaborated with Pivot Bio to make better strains of these microbes. And this is an example of a legacy strain used by some of the biotech firms uh, like uh, kind of, you know, AD, Archer Daniel Midlands and others. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, they have a higher yield. But the current synthetic biology techniques only allow the insertion of one gene and one promoter at a time. And you, you have to go through dozens and dozens of genes and various combinations. And it takes years to actually develop these strains, typically. And so we found a way in my lab that we can insert very large pieces of DNA, 50,000 bases and beyond, with very high cell survival, with very parallel messes. And so if one makes this commercially available, uh, it could really allow you to manipulate dozens of genes at a time so you can get to combinatorial changes and you get not the millions of changes that Francis Arnold introduced, but going from one to dozens is would be a very big step. Just, right. have just about two minutes left. Okay, so let me talk about CO2, carbon capture. And uh, another uh, thing being considered is uh, to take all the plant residual stuff. Can you dry it out, sterilize it, put it in a big plastic non-biodegradable baggie, use bulldozers and put it on the ground. And that's carbon sequestration. It turns out that all the plant residues could be gigatons of carbon sequestration. And in all the fallow land, you can actually grow things that grow very, very rapidly, like switchgrass and eucanthus. So ultimately, you know, we uh, need another agricultural resolution, revolution, but the population increases and uh, it's increasing dramatically. Uh, and it may peak at 11, 12 billion. 10 billion, who knows, and by mid-century. But the problem is the economists are saying, uh, you want to grow your GDP, and so you want to have more young workers to uh, have than to 
produce an economy for the a smaller aging population. And this is known in the United States as a pyramid or a Ponzi scheme. So ultimately we're gonna to have to address that. And with that, I'll stop. All right, thank you very much. That was a tour de force of the history of agriculture and, uh, and the future, uh, what we need to get done in order to be able to feed the population. Uh, we're, we're right at 11.30, so I don't think we're gonna have time to take any, uh, any questions, but I can put a very quick one to you, which is we spent a lot of time talking about the sort of policy changes about how you can, how you can increase um, uh, the health of the, of the global population by providing more food with them and, and, um, and then some of the technological opportunities we have. What, what do you see as the balance between the, um, the, the, the short-term or, or longer-term uh, reach of both the policy and the, and the technological opportunities that we have? Here? Well, the policy is gonna be really measured by people's ease in accepting technology that you have to uh, say, we, we are concerned about unintended consequences. You have to roll out very carefully. Uh, unfortunately, the GMO had a very bad reputation based on Roundup Ready crops. <laughs> and you could have had golden rice, you could have had BT eggplant and cotton. <laughs> and so uh, that's unfortunate. You can't undo history. But if you look at, I'll go back to what Norman Borlaug said, uh, we'll need GMO to feed a population of 11 billion. We're using half the arable land. If you want to uh, not use up the rest of the arable land, uh, you better do something. And, and, then, and then in the meantime, use natural population declines. When people get richer, they have fewer babies. And this is a natural birth control that's great. The only thing is you've got a bunch of other people saying, no, have more babies because you can have a bigger GDP. So you better redefine GDP <laughs> and other things and you say, let the natural birth control take root and you want people to get richer. <laughs> and, and so we need all this stuff. If you really want to get anything off this rat race uh, and Ponzi scheme, you have to do all these things. 